Hello students, welcome to another lecture. This lecture is on yoga as a countercultural production. We've been talking about it as a transcultural production, something that um, is participated in by a number of national cultures or um, uh, different um, ethnicities or points of view which are related to um, ge geographies. In this lecture, I want to talk about yoga as counterculture, that is, a culture which is, in some cases, indigenous to its mother culture, but remains counter to it, remains in a critical position to it, remains as an alternative. So when yoga first comes to America, and I review these facts a little bit and looking at it from other directions, it is a countercultural option for certain uh, social elites uh, mainly on the East Coast, <clears throat> people who are playing host to this great Indian teacher, Swami Vivekananda. Vivekananda is a countercultural figure because he's not American. He's a countercultural figure because his appearance is unique. He's, he's dark skinned, he's, he's got this bold charisma, he wears unusual Indian clothes. Um, so, for this mainly white society, this dominant white society of the 1890s, he's new. Um, and he also is teaching practices which do not have the same doing aims, working aims, utilitarian aims of the emerging scientifically minded culture of the 1890s, the, the materialistic, capitalistic culture of the 1890s, which by the 1890s it's really in full swing, it's really moving forward. The, um, there's a huge bifurcation and um, uh, uh, wealth in that period, and there's a Great Depression in that period, so economic factors are roiling the waters of culture, and America is emerging as a national power and whatnot. Um, so he comes into this context offering a practice from another nation, and offering a practice which is counterculture to American culture because of its exotic nature, because of its transnational nature, but also because it is religious in a very profound way if we can use that term religious, which is a very difficult term. It's focused on transcendence. Yoga is focused on transcendence in a way that pulls us out of our everyday cultural experience. It's not like going to church. It's not like um, something that keeps us in this culture. It's not orthodox. It's what we call heterodox. It challenges the orthodoxy of our everyday lives. It challenges our horizontal orientation, our this-worldly orientation, our aim towards health, wealth, love, and happiness, and seeks to give us a fifth alternative, which is that of transcendence, getting out of this world and all of its particular needs, getting into this place of pure consciousness. So because yoga offers that, it is always in critical relationship to any culture it enters into, even its mother culture of India. So as it comes here, and it comes much more powerfully in the 1960s as a countercultural option, it is already a countercultural production just by its very definition, because it attempts to drag us out of our merely worldly concerns, dra dra drag us out, uh, drag every hair of our being out of this state of doing into a profound state of being, into a profound state of dis dissolution into the experience of consciousness. In the Indian context, it had always been countercultural. It was always the extreme option. It was always the renunciant option, the people who had renounced the regular life of everyday householders. The householders, too, were seen as people who would eventually move towards transcendent, but not necessarily at this moment, not until they were old and gray. Yeah, They still had kids to take care of. They still had jobs to take care of. They still had a society to take care of. And the yogis were counter to that in India. They offer this option of renunciation, of sannyasa, of throwing down all of the options of everyday life and moving into this kind of homeless wandering stage often, or moving into sometimes a, a, um, an ashram, but often into this homeless state of wandering and depending on nature to support you while devoting all of one's time to freeing oneself of the deaths of karma, of the deaths of, the deaths of action. So, in the Indian context, yoga is countercultural. When it comes to America, it is countercultural. It's countercultural 
in the in the 1890s when it arrives. It's counterculture in the 1920s when America is also in another huge effusive phase of success, which comes crashing down in the 1929 um, stock stock fall. Um, but the 20s were amazing when Pramahansa Yogananda comes and begins to preach. And then in the 1960s again, after the Asian Inclusion Act is ended by Congress, actually by actually by Johnson, I believe, Lyndon Johnson, the president, and Indian immigrants are allowed to come to America, and with that wave comes many swamis who are coming to teach, and they have rich, fertile soil because at that time the baby boomers, all the 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 generation of the bone in the post World War War baby boom, are in this kind of resistant state to mainstream culture, and they're looking for alternatives to American mainstream culture. They're looking to alternatives to Christianity. They're looking for alternatives to being caught up in the cycle of um, conformity. Conformity is a big word in the 1960s. It's kind of fade from, faded from our national conversation, but that was a big, big issue. Avoiding becoming the corporate man, usually, the corporate man or woman, the uh, living in within the roles of a dutiful housewife or a dutiful husband um, in that era, which the 1950s were so much about and the 1960s were so much not about. <laughs> so in this reaction to a very orthodox culture. Yoga comes in in the 1960s, especially, especially post-1964, um, after the laws of change around immigration, and America embraces yoga as a countercultural practice, now counterculture to the West. It was counterculture to its home culture of India. It comes to the West. Of course, it's counterculture to the production of um, uh, consumers, consumer uh, activities in the West and whatnot, work, scientific worldview and whatnot. Um, but it persists and adapts and, tr and transforms, and this is where we get into the transcultural part. As uh, Mark Singleton puts it so eloquently, it moves into giving us both cosmic and cosmetic alternatives. It becomes a physical culture practice. It becomes a practice which gives us radiant health and indomitable health, health that you know, where we can resist disease. And these merely worldly goals that align with the goal of health, wealth, love, and happiness um, become a primary vehicle for this counterculture practice. It still remains counterculture, but cultural, but not with the profound potency that it had before because its aim towards transcendence becomes optional, becomes secondary, becomes kind of an add-on or part of the larger language of serving health, wealth, love, and happiness, of serving our bodies, of serving our peace of mind, of becoming, yoga becomes salve as opposed to salvation. It serves our activity in this world. It becomes a cult of excellence, part of one of the cults of excellence, a way to, to self-improve. And there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but as a countercultural production, it takes on a different function than its profound function in the Indian context. That is not to say that it didn't have worldly aims in the Indian context, and it's not to say that even the yogis in the Indian context didn't often aim at merely worldly things, like cities, miraculous powers, or aimed at immortality for them. Its countercultural form in India, of course, was different, and as I, as I suggest, more profound, because people were in radical opposition to mainstream society. Here it comes and it becomes kind of part of a menu of larger options, counterculture options. At, at the time, the 1960s, rock and roll, drugs, um, you know, moving off of, out of cities and into the land. There were many ways in which the baby boomers manifested resistance to mainstream culture, protesting the Vietnam War, um, becoming hippies, wearing their hair long, wearing, you know, ragged clothes, not doing the kinds of things that the uh, straight-laced culture of the 1950s had done. So that's a little primer on counterculture. I'm running out of time. This thing is going to die if I don't uh, close it soon enough. Thank you for listening.